thanks for having me. It's an absolutely honor to share our first experience in neurobotics for the neurorehabilitation. And uh, I have no disclosures. And ladies and gentlemen, we are currently in the fourth phase of uh, industrial revolution, including artif uh, artificial intelligence, nano and biotechnology, uh, 3D printing, printing and robotics. And um, the field of robotics evolves dramatically. We are talking about like multitasking robots, about robots which are designed um, to fight Ebola and um, part of robotics are the exoskeletons and it was surprisingly uh, surprising for me that um, the future is already here this newspaper article is almost five years old talking about exoskeletons and different applications here for soldiers for health workers for people with spinal cord injuries and even the NASA tested exoskeletons uh, in order to um, support the astronauts on their missions and last but definitely not least uh, this Japanese company Cyberdyne invented the HAL exoskeleton and uh, this model was uh, used uh, in order to support the people who are doing the cleaning up after this uh, Great East Japan earthquake and I have a personal connection to this event. I um, did a practice ship in Taipei for a couple of months and spent some days in Kyoto and Tokyo and I left Tokyo grounds 27 minutes that happened and um, but anyway this um, exoskeleton the original one looks like this and this exoskelet is unique in terms of it uses uh, EMG based neuromuscular feedback system in order to support the patient and so we had this great Japanese innovation and um, Professor Sankai, as I know, uh, believed it shouldn't be uh, used for military applications and uh, they imagined and tested some different, several different industrial applications, but still there was a missing piece. And so what he needed was German mythology. So this is one of my this is my other boss from Germany, Professor Schilton. He saw this device on, during a Japanese conference and he got in contact with Professor Sankai and asked him, did you ever use this for a patient with spinal cord injuries? And he said like, no. So what he did is he took this device to Germany to his hospital, as Dr. Chapman already mentioned, the oldest trauma hospital in the world, opened 1890 uh, for the coal mine workers. And um, here's Bochum in the northwest of Germany. And he um, started and set up a couple of pilot studies in order to answer the question, is this feasible? for a patient with spinal cord injuries, what are appropriate indications? And do we see functional neurological improvements? So, and about six years later, and 10 to uh, 10 or 11 studies later, they had in total experience with 120 patients. Um, they concluded it's feasible, effective, and safe in spinal cord injury patients, they could show it increases the endurance and pace, even without, uh, especially without the exoskeleton, it, it increases the whiskey score, and no major advance, uh, adverse events were recorded. And I was a little bit surprised when I did the literature research, this is just a couple of weeks ago, exoskeleton, search term, PubMed, more than 2,000 hits. But most of them are military or industrial applications, like this Berkeley exoskeleton from 2004. And uh, when you look for spinal cord injury applications or um, studies, you have still 170. Uh, stroke, even more, 280 hits. But when it comes to neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis, 14 and um, very little data. So we know that this system has to be, uh, has proven to be beneficial in the rehabilitation of spinal cord injury patients, but uh, no one really analyzed so far what is the impact uh, for patients with neurological disorder. So we wanted to um, analyze patients with neurological disorders to see is their improvement in functional mobility, life quality, and bladder function. We set up a prospective interventional pilot study 
with six patients, all with a unique uh, etiology, and all of the patients underwent um, 60 sessions of a body weight supported treadmill training in a hull suit over a course of 12 weeks. We measured several outcome data for the functional mobility and EQ5D for life quality and the UDI6 and the IIQ7 in uh, order to analyze the bladder function, and the first follow-up was six months. And this is how it looks like. Um, this is the hull suit and a harness here at the back you see the control unit and um, these are our results so we could see that all patients improved the six minute uh, six minute walk distance you have three columns check for updates <laughs> you have three columns pre pre-training post which is basically a 12 week follow-up and the six months follow-up and all patients improved the six minute walk distance all patients could decrease the time that what need that was needed for the um, time up and go test and all patients increased the distance covered on a treadmill during their training sessions. Um, five out of six patients improved their Berg balance scale. Five out of six patients improved their whiskey score. And sometimes the video says more than a thousand words. So this is a 54-year-old uh, patient walking performance with our baseline. So uh, before training. And this is how it looks like after 12 weeks. Same patient, performance for 10 minute walk test before training. She needs, uh, as you see, she needs some support from the PT. Balance is a big a problem. Please don't, don't look at the numbers of this table. We set up this table, this color-coded table, just to visualize and illustrate our results. Basically, green means an improvement, blue means stable in the score, and red is a worsening. And when we look at this table, we can see that nearly all patients improved in all measured uh, mobility scores. Uh, but guess what? Analyzing the life quality, only one patient got better at the six months follow up. And the results for the bladder function were inconsistent. And that was surprising. And when we, for instance, look at the first patient, 32 year old, had a spinal cord infarct, um, basically a T12 AGSC patient, she wasn't even able to perform the six minute walk distance test or to do the time up and go step before that training. And she improved remarkable and her life quality got worse. So we got in contact with the PTs, talked with the patient, and ending up she said she, she had higher expectations. So it's like difficult to measure sometimes, and this is the very, very first look on our upcoming results for our MS group. So we currently finished um, our third and fourth cohort, and there are included five patients with MS, and just when we see those two graphs, these are the first six patients. And you see here um, in the treadmill pace a steady uh, increase over time. And here it looks like that it's very inconsistent. You have probably a higher flu fluctuation in MS patients, but we have still to further analyze these results. And when you look in the literature, basically there are only two studies analyzing the effect of exoskeletons in patients with multiple sclerosis. One is showing that um, it may improve accuracy, walking, and posture in MS uh, patients. Um, the other one is a controlled study, a randomized controlled study with 52 patients. But they did only two sessions over a course of six weeks. But they could also show that a patient who did a, a robot-assisted rehabilitation had a um, higher walking endurance, a better balance, and a better quality of life uh, compared with conventional walking therapy. And there are some studies showing that exoskeletons are beneficial for a patient with stroke, subacute and chronic, and uh, there are also systematic reviews showing uh, results of other exoskeleton systems which are um, safe and beneficial. And um, also in patients with chronic strokes, 
this this um, system has to be uh, as proven to be beneficial. And its latest update, systematic review, 13 randomized controlled trials, um, stroke patients using robot devices are more likely to reach better results and can be positively affected. So when we take all this together, it seems like that we deal with three different type of patients. We have the spinal cord injury patients, we have the stroke patients, and we have patients with neurological disorders. And basically, based on our experience and the literature, spinal cord injury patients, we are good to go. So we need more studies, but basically there's no need to wait anymore. We should uh, intervene maybe earlier in the rehabilitation. And um, for stroke, there is a decent amount of uh, evidence in the literature, but still not clear what are the difference in chronic and super good stroke patients, and there's little, uh, there's no evidence um, of neurorehabilitation in patients with diseases like um, MS, so we have two big question marks there. So in conclusion, um, how assisted training is feasible and effective in neurorehabilitation, of inpatient with neurological disorders, all patients improved their functional mobility, impact on life quality and better function could not be shown. The next frontier might be an early intervention and the functional preservation. And sure, we have several limitations, small group, heterogeneous group, we have a limited follow-up, we didn't have a control group patient uh, who underwent conventional physiotherapy and there's only little evidence in the literature. And but still, it feels like we did sciences research-wise our first step. We literally helped some patients to do their first step. And the next steps might be that neurobotics um, are going to be used in more patients more frequently earlier in the neurorehabilitation phase. And we have to analyze uh, the long-term outcomes. This all might lead to uh, patient-tailored rehabilitation. And our next steps are clear to further analyze all third and fourth cord, analyze the multiple sclerosis cords, further analyze life quality, bladder function, and chances in medication, and we're waiting for the one year follow-up. Our total goal is 30 patients, and this is one of our PTs, one of our MS patients, and um, it takes about 45 minutes at the beginning, and uh, at the end, about 30 minutes to set that up. So I wanted to use this opportunity to thank the PTs because they are the real stars in uh, this treatment and this rehabilitation, because without their dedication, passion, and hard work, all these results wouldn't be possible. Thank you very much.